What is going on guys? In today's video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be looking at a new piece of hardware and the piece of hardware I'm referring to is the switch that's sitting currently next to me. So this switch, you might have seen it in the PLC box that I have behind me. And usually the switch would allow me to essentially communicate from my laptop to the various PLCs that I have in that box. A lot of you have been asking me questions about the Stratix 5700 switch. So in today's video, we're going to be going over the quick setup. But before we do so, I wanted to demonstrate the two different switches. So this is an Allen Bradley 18,000 switch. And we're going to look a little bit more in depth in the data sheet, but essentially this is a different switch than what I normally use, but it allows you a greater flexibility and is usually used for upstream devices that are not going to be necessarily just PLC panels. Now the Stratix 5700 series is a switch which you will find very commonly in PLC panels. And it differs from the 8000 series that it's actually, it's more ruggedized, but it's also, it has different features which are required more on the panel side. That being said, both of the switches have the exact same quick setup procedure, depending of course on the firmware revision. So there's going to be two different uh, procedures that you can follow. That being said, we're going to be going through the more recent device procedure. So we're going to be resetting the switch back to factory condition. And then I'm going to show you how to give the switch an IP address, how to go online with it and change some of the other settings. And in future videos, we're going to be exploring some of the other intricacies and features of these two switches. Before we get started with today's video, we just wanted to quickly point out all the great content we've been releasing on the Solus PLC YouTube channel. Channel. And this includes industrial automation, PLC programming, as well as HMI development. And if you enjoy this type of content, we would really appreciate it if you could click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell in order to receive the latest and greatest content we will be posting to the channel. So before we connect to the two switches, it's important to understand the hardware. So here, like I've mentioned, I have the Stratix 18,000 series switch as well as a Stratix 5700 series switch. And the two switches are available in different models. In this case, the 5700 series is, as you can see, a six port switch. This goes up to 20, so it can have a similar form factor than the 8000. That being said, let's take a quick look at the two different switches. So the 8000 series in this case provides 10 different ports. So there's going to be eight ports on the right side. There's also going to be port one and two, which can either be over RJ45 or if you insert a card, which allows you to go over fiber optic. And of course, you also have a console port. So those of you who are not familiar, that's a Cisco standard. So these switches at the end of the day internally contain a full Cisco layer. And you'll notice that there's going to be this little Cisco logo. So you can program these switches over what's called Cisco iOS. And that's essentially a terminal way of programming these. That being said, we are going to connect to them into RS Logix and Studio 5000. The next thing on the switch that I do want to point out, so this 8000 series switch, if we put it on the side, we can open the side panel. And this side panel is essentially a way to expand the capacity of the switch. So I'm just going to use a screwdriver, a flathead in order to lift up this panel. And you'll notice that under this metal protector, which essentially does not allow any dust to come into the internals of the switch, you'll find this connector that allows you, like I said, to add on different modules onto the switch and expand its capabilities. We are going to put this switch onto the back side. So of course on the back, just to quickly mention, it's going to go on a DIN rail. On the front side, the next item that's extremely important is going to be this express setup button. So this button is recessed and that's what's going to allow us to perform the initial setup once the switch is sent from the factory. Let's just put it on the side for now and let's turn our attention to the 5700 series switch. So the form factor is somewhat similar. There's going to be a couple of differences. So first of all, you're going to have the same ports. You're going to have the console port, but the express setup button, as you can see, is going to be all the way at the top. You're also going to have the same 
uh, the same two power options. So there's going to be power A and power B. And this is a feature on the switches which allows you to have a redundant power supply. So essentially you plug in two different modules into the switch and if one of them fails then the other one is going to take over. You're also going to have a few status LEDs that are present on both switches. So that's going to be the setup AIP net AIP mod and these are extremely important because they are going to be the status lights which we're going to need to pay attention to as we enter express setup. There's also going to be a couple of inputs and outputs into the switch as you can see on the bottom right hand corner and those uh, are going to be programmable as well through the switch and last but not least there's going to be a slot into which you can insert a um, essentially an SD card and in this case the SD card is going to contain the firmware so you can flash the switch or change the settings through an SD card and you can do so by unscrewing this little terminal on the top of the switch or on the faceplate of the switch and that's pretty much it so let's just bring in a power supply 24 volts DC so I have that ready right here so it's an Allen Bradley 1606 XLP power supply and as you can probably notice by the status of the LED, it is powered on. So once I plug in the DC power onto the switch, you'll notice that it's going to go through the boot sequence. And once the boot sequence is complete, we can enter the express setup. But it's going to take you, uh, I believe, 90 seconds based on the data sheet. Sometimes it takes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. But you do want to wait until the sequence is in the right mode as the data sheet recommends. So let's wait for that and we're going to come back in just a few moments. Okay, so the switch has finally finished the boot up sequence and that's indicated by the setup as well as the EIP mod LED lights. So as you can see, both of those lights are blinking, which indicates that the switch is ready to enter the express setup. And that's once again written in the data sheet. And what we're going to do is go through the quick setup procedure, which require us to be in this exact mode. That being said, if you miss this mode, you simply need to remove the power and apply it back to the switch until these lights are lit up exactly as shown here. The next thing we're going to need is going to be a paper clip or a way to access this express setup button. Like I said, it's recessed inside of the switch. So it's either going to take a paper clip or a piece of wire. What we're going to have to do is press this button exactly between one and four seconds. And by pressing it between exactly those times, we're going to enter quick setup. If you press it for longer, you're going to enter some of the different modes. So you're going to have to reset. That being said, the lights are going to flash exactly the same way, same way. What we do have to notice is that we're going to have a port that's going to open up. So let's try that right now. So I'm going to press this between one and four seconds, like I've said, and you should hear a distinctive click. So three, two, one, and then one, two, a release. And what you will probably not notice that well on the camera, but I'm going to bring this up closely. But port number one, despite not having a cable, is going to start flashing like so. And that means that we're ready to quick set up through that specific port. So the next thing that you're going to need is an RJ45 connection between that port and your computer so I'm just going to install the cable on the side and I'm going to plug in the other end onto the PC and we're going to see the settings that we need to configure on the switch in order to be able to use it as a uh, essentially as an open switch for now and then we're going to access some of the other features in the next video. So now that we have the switch connected we're going to have to go through a few configurations through our computer. So the first thing that I do want to open is going to be control panel. So from the control panel, we do need to make a couple of changes. So I'm going to uh, go to network and sharing center. And I've shown you this before, but essentially we need to change the adapter settings, go into your ethernet card. Next, you do want to go into properties and IP version four, double click that. And we're going to set it to obtain an IP address automatically and DNS as well. We're going to press on OK. And we're going to open a browser of our choice. So in my case, I'm going to use Chrome. So I'm just going to open a new Chrome window and drag that onto the screen. 
So here from this window, we do need to navigate to the IP address that has been assigned by the default to the switch. And this address is going to be 169.254.0.1. And if we press enter, what we're going to usually find is a prompt for a, for a username and password. And once again, this is also going to be given us in the manual. Okay, so here we have the prompt to sign in. So if everything works correctly and provided that you don't take too much time, I was actually looking up a way to set up in a different mode. So the switch, like I said, is going to be accessible over 169.254.0.1. And once we are in this prompt, the username is going to be admin. Uh, sorry, the username is going to be blank and the password is going to be switch by default. So switch. Let's type that in and see if we can sign in. We can, of course, update password. That's because I've used something different on a different device. So we're going to say no. And if everything works correctly, we should be redirected to the device manager of the switch. I'm just going to reposition this window so you can see a little bit better. And sometimes it doesn't work as well as you would like in Chrome. So sometimes you can try a different browser. Let's just refresh Chrome once again and see if that solves the issue. Because the switch should be loading a default page which allows us to perform some of the some of the setup if everything goes well. So let's let's try Internet Explorer. This is usually a problem with uh, some of the Rockwell devices are just not configured to work with. So we're going to close this and then we're going to navigate to that same IP address. So 169.254.0.1. And once again, the username is going to be blank and the password is going to be switch. We're going to press OK. And hopefully everything works through Internet Explorer. I do recommend that you uh, still try Chrome. It does work for me once the switch is set up and everything is uh, configured, but sometimes it doesn't like it at the very beginning. So here we are in the Express setup. As you can see, we can give our switch a name. So I'm just going to call it Solus PLC. Solus PLC switch. VLAN 1 by default, IP address is going to be static. So 192.168.1.66. Actually, let's make that 70. So that's going to be the address. The default gateway is going to remain as such. And usually I give it a user and then password. I leave it as it was by default. But of course, if you're working on a plant environment, I do recommend that you choose a different username and password. You can also change the advanced settings from this as well, but uh, you can click this to leave it as default. And we're going to submit. Maybe we do need to, uh, the host name contains, so we do need to use an underscore. And let's click on submit. So hopefully everything works as expected. Switch. Let's see if that works. So we are still connected to the switch. That being said, as soon as we give it a new IP address, we will have to go and essentially access it from this different IP address. That being said, we have performed the full setup. And as you can see, we have the switch panel displayed through this web interface, and it's showing us as being connected on port one. And of course, we can go into the different configuration settings onto uh, which we're going to explore in some of the next videos. But the switch should be working. The same exact procedure can be used for the Stratix 8000 series, the switch that I showed you at the beginning. So if you, any, if you have any questions, make sure to post them in the comment down below. Thank you guys so much for watching my content. If you have any questions on this topic, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. And if you can spend five seconds of your time liking as well as sharing that video, if you've enjoyed it, that would mean absolutely the world to me. And if you have any suggestions for the channel, what kind of hardware software I should be covering, then make sure to leave that down there as well. See you next time. Take care. Bye.